Well, we don't talk briefly about what we have learned or not from the past. If we look at the last three decades, I'm gonna very first and foremost provide three lessons. Uh, George Anna is my mentor, who I think I'm putting him asleep while I talk, <laughs> um, told me in that presentation has three points. I'm gonna say a lot of things, but I want three points to make, and hopefully those are the lessons you learned today. First, if we look at scientific progress over the three or four decades, and you can put progress in quotation marks, we have seen two things. What is the reaction? Public outcry, sometimes public hype, organizations, nations, individuals, calling for policy making, for norms to be adopted. Most of these norms have been reactive in nature because we jump to the bank, okay? But also we have seen that so far we have failed every attempt to adopt an international binding document, a norm that is enforceable, that encompass those fundamental human rights those fundamental biomedical ethical principles that we all hold so dear and we are trying to protect in our activities, right? So that's lesson one, why we have failed. Why nobody can claim moral leadership on this? And I'm leaving aside per personally the European Union with the 1997 Convention of Human Rights and Biomedicine. So the legacy of the 90s, quickly, we translated the fundamental human rights into principles for biomedical research. We took the legacies of Nuremberg, of Helsinki, uh, the Belmont Report, and others, and tried to protect the patient, a human being on a patient-physician relationship or the research subject, right? But another legacy here is that researchers and physicians start adopting um, self-regulation, right? There was two intentions for this. And maybe uh, that was the main attempt to not wait for governments, for NGOs, for their own, uh, for international bodies to regulate their practice, to establish controls or not, or maybe intentionally to forestall external controls. So lesson one. From the 90s to the 2000s, we have the birth of the gen ethics movement. We have the human genome, we have WHO, UNESCO, um, Hugo, and all these bodies adopting a lot of, of policies is still with the legacies of fundamental human rights incorporated into principles. Uh, and, and we have, most importantly, the declaration of Inuyama, the first to prospectively look at ethical legal aspects in this area, calling, uh, bringing the attention on that the public, they said, are um, creating genetic exceptionalism and uh, saying we have to stop and not being so genetic deterministic. But with the birth of Dolly, and this is legacy two, uh, or lesson two, we all react in one way or the other to condemn human reproductive cloning, rightly so. But we look at this policy model very linear. One technology, one reaction. And History has told us that our approach for being so hefty we were, was ineffective. We were not able to encompass the advances of progress of science. We were not able to anticipate that maybe the battle a decade later will be direct to gen uh, uh, consumer testing um, and other issues. So reactive policy looking at cloning, germline, and focusing on the embryo. The embryo distracted us for looking at are effective mecha governance mechanisms in place? Do we have ongoing oversight or not? So when I go to the 2000s and onwards, and with genome-wide association studies, with population genetics, with the super hype of stem cells, um, and, and all this, I see, what is the trend now? We are looking at more complex models of policy making because we are more multidisciplinary, we try to encompass too, we try to be more prospective. We still claim we are trying to protect all those individuals in one way or the other are contributing to the research enterprise. But we realize that research is a global enterprise that begin at the local level. So we start establishing a number of international consortia. What we didn't learn is that self-regulation alone is not efficient. Although some of these consortia 
are looking at not only maintaining the quality, the integrity of science in their exchanges and looking or trying to uh, vouch for the ethical and legal provenance of the biological materials, the data they are sharing amongst jurisdictions, is still nobody's looking at the strengths of these governance mechanisms that are in place, whether they are transparent enough, whether we, we can control what it's doing. And policy have shifted for what should be permitted or prohibited to how to regulate the use in the right way and the other way. However, um, we have not learned from the past and we are replacing, and this is where I'm going to lesson three, the embryo with the egg. We have the embryo centric drug to egg centric approach and we forgot the context. Why this is important? Because we cannot individualize the egg and forget about the context in which commercialization, if not trafficking, of human biological materials are occurring. We have organs, etc. I'm going to an example of IJD, induced pluripotent stem cells, the new hype. Researchers are not concerned about cloning anymore. They don't want the eggs, human eggs that much for research. And I work in the, I make my living in the stem cell and regenerative medicine area, and I'm funded for a major um, uh, funding institutions in the world, but I hope I don't bring in bias here saying that. Um, actually, I could lose my job for being so critical. Um, uh, um, I, I would say we are forgetting that if this is the new frontier in regenerative medicine, we don't need the eggs. We need the tissues. There are somatic cell to the tissues. So we forget this context. We are forgetting that regular human beings like us, we say we want to protect the vulnerable, and we look at women, rightly so. But we are forgetting that, for example, and going back to the stem cell hype, we forget about stem cell tourism. We look at reproductive tourism, rightly so. But we forget about how individuals like us are being exploited by commercial enterprise. And a lot of times in a number of countries, in India, in China, in our own backyard, by enabled by the government. Why? Because we are reactive, because we like the linear approach, and because we never stop to look at what is going on and what is the context when this happened. So that's the third lesson is, should we broader our concern? I know we have to pick our battles. I know we need to, to, to find an area and being trying to champion to an action. But let's not forget the whole, the whole spectrum. And, and look in, into who can claim them moral leadership to make this happen. You know, we forget, we think about the US all the time, but we forget, as I said again, and this is a quote for a colleague of mine, Per Rook, that she said, remember always that research is a global enterprise that begins at the national level. And I will not say it only research. A lot of times it's the practice of medicine. And when we look at reproductive tourism, again, we are looking at globalization because the materials are not coming from us. And we are not being consistent. So policy, I'm out of time, but I would just say policy all of the time is the reality, is the result of political compromise on trade-off and sometimes the excuse is that if we don't accept this, otherwise we can thwart any other policy development. I would say maybe we should slow and try to find uh, something that is comprehensive and that will be enforceable. Thank you.